Hey, insiders. Want to learn how to develop a great mobile strategy for your music and career? Well, if you do, then you don't want to miss this episode with Ralph Simon, visionary founder and chief executive at Mobilium Global. We discuss what are the best ways to harness this new and emerging opportunities that exist for you as an artist in mobile technology and much, much more. Stay tuned. This episode of the Mubu TV Insider Video Series is brought to you by the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 30 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Guide, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. We're coming to you live from Muse Expo here in Hollywood, California, from the Roosevelt Hotel. And we managed to catch up with Ralph Simon, CEO of Mobileum. Ralph, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Now, you've had an interesting career. You started, I believe, in the record business a long time ago before transitioning. Can you talk about what made you transition out of music and into mobile technology? Uh, sure. I was living in uh, Los Angeles. I had been part of the team that was running Capitol Records and Blue Note, the great jazz label, not far from the Roosevelt Hotel uh, here in Hollywood, Hollywood and Vine, in the Capitol Tower. And uh, it was increasingly obvious to me that uh, things were changing. I had been living in Silicon Valley and San Francisco before moving to L.A., and I was very fortunate in being in Silicon Valley right at the start of what became the Internet when CD-ROMs were really the main focus. And um, I remember going to speak to the uh, chairman of uh, EMI at the time, which owned Capital. Of course, Capital now is owned by Universal, parts of it. Um, and I'd said to him that uh, things were changing and all of those trucks that were taking CDs to Tower Records might not be carrying as full a complement of CDs in the future. And don't you think we should do something really great to do this new stuff? And he said to me, well, let's rather be first to be second. Let someone else like Sony or someone else take the lead. We shouldn't compete with them. And I thought to myself, that's rather short-sighted. But, but the other thing, too, that really, for me, was has always been a cornerstone from the very earliest days when I used to play in a band, from the earliest days of starting an indie label and then starting Jive Records and Zomba, I always, we always used to take great notes of what T-shirts kids were wearing. It was a great thing with music publishing. If you saw a lot of kids wearing an ACDC T-shirt or a Def Leppard T-shirt or um, a Scorpions T-shirt or, let's say, an EDM T-shirt, Calvin Harris, whoever it might be in the EDM world, you took note of that. And around this period, particularly here in California and especially in LA, which was still a bit of a laggard behind San Francisco, Silicon Valley and Seattle, where you were seeing a lot more of digitalia being presented as a fundamental new force. Um, I think one of the things about having been reared in the music business, I always used to follow the career of Seymour Stein, the, one of the greatest A&R men that has ever lived and who signed some of the greatest artists, Ramones, Talking Heads, Depeche Mode, you name it. And Seymour had once picked up a group from Germany um, called Boney M of a record called By the Rivers of Babylon. By the Rivers of Babylon. You know that song? Sure. And it always struck me that you've got to keep an eye on what's going on in the international markets. Like, for example, Seymour picked up a great song from Japan called Sukiyaki, which became a huge hit now, this is very, many, many years ago. But the point is that in the same way as what did the fox say, mm -hmm. the hit from Norway, yes. things happen internationally. And I kept seeing that if you looked at Japan and Korea, mm -hmm. particularly Japan, there was a telco in Japan called Docomo. And Docomo had got this whole content process where unlike anyone else in the mobile business anywhere in the world, 
The telco kept 9% and the artist got 91%. And I thought, man, this is great for talent. This is great for artists. We've got to really study what Docomo are doing. What are they selling that they are giving 91% to the talent, the label, the music publisher? And they were selling ringtones. And I thought, you know, we've got to find a way of somehow getting involved in this, taking music. But one of the big problems is the music publishers in a time of Napster were very, very, well, I would say freaking out would be a good way of putting it, really, of saying, there's something going on here where all of our music is going to be pilfered. And this was the period where Napster were front cover of Time magazine. Mm. So, but I... I kept on studying what was going on with Docomo and then secondarily in Korea, which has got the fastest broadband provisioning in the world. And I kept seeing young people more and more and more are using mobile devices, mobile phones, they're texting. And that really was part of the huge stimulus. That plus, when I'd heard that comment from the chairman of the of Capital, I just thought to myself, man, the future's changing and this is not where the you are not what the future is representing. We've got to be looking at a whole new way of getting to this whole new audience. This was like seeing the kid with the ACDC t-shirt that made me go to a producer I used to look after at the time, Mutt Lang, that made Highway to Hell, Back in Black for those about to rock, and say, listen, man, this band are going to happen. All you got to do is put backing vocals on their vocal tracks, and we can really have a big hit. Well, anyway, so cut a long story short. Um, I found a team in Santa Monica of some really visioneering, futurist-aligned guys who were really early, early believers in digital, and they had come up with uh, an app that allowed you to attach to an email without a driver, because in those days you needed a driver to make something work on your computer, in addition to your operating system. And uh, they came up with this, uh, something called a digital audio postcard, which allowed you to clip near video, scrolling text and music. Someone in uh, Finland got to hear about it. We thought, oh, this is our big break. I invested some money in the startup. And uh, I thought if we went to Helsinki, maybe we could get a contract with Nokia. Maybe it'll help us with our funding because we've only got another 14 weeks of money left. <laughs> And I was standing uh, outside the hotel waiting for the cab to take me to Nokia headquarters. And I saw this group of Finnish teenagers uh, standing outside, outside the hotel, about five or six of them. Two of them were going like this, sending some text messages, early form. And one, when his phone rang, came out with this melody. Now, it wasn't instrumental. It was monophonic. So it sounded like Linus's clunky piano. You know, that kind of computerized sound Yes, that you hear with da 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 da, -da, -da but it'd be yes. slightly different. And I heard that and I had an aha experience. I said, aha, that's music publishing in the hand. Let me take this back to the guys in Santa Monica, 14th Street. Let me take it to them and say, guys, I've just seen this, our digital audio postcard. Why don't we go to the publishers, get the license? We'll make monophonics. Let's do it. They said, good idea. Why don't you go and do it? We think we've got the transport mechanism that can do it. So I had made quite a lot of friends when I was uh, both at Capital and Zomba, called up some of my friends who were lawyers and particularly publishers. And I thought, well, they'd be very receptive. And I'd said to them, listen, there's this whole new thing. It's mobile. I mean, you guys, you got to take a look at it. It'll be great for the songwriters. It's a good way of getting the publishing going. And I got an almost, I would say, unanimous no uh, we're not sure. It's a new medium. There's so much piracy. How do we know we're going to be protected? And I would knock on doors until my knuckles started to bleed. Well, not exactly, but that was the feeling at any rate. And um, it was very, very hard to get a license. There was one person, a woman, a wonderful, wonderful woman by the name of Jody Graham. Jody was a lawyer here for many years, one of the first women to break through the glass ceiling. And Jody was running Sony ATV Music. And Jody said, you know what? I think this is quite a cool idea. This expands the reach of the publishing company. I'll give you a license. She said, you give us a license. Well, do you mean the Beatles as well? You mean Brian Adams? You mean uh, some of the key copyrights? Sure. Yeah. And then I could take that and go to the other publishers and gradually, bit by bit, with a few lawsuits in, mingled in between, uh, uh, EMI Music at the time, uh, we're very, very much against any of this new stuff. But anyway, to cut a long story short, we were able to demonstrate that 
this was quite interesting. And with 12 days of money left in the company, 12 days. So think about it. 12 days. If we had no more money, it would be adios, amigo. <laughs> we managed to get a contract with AT&T's former name, Singular, in Atlanta, to be their exclusive ringtone provider on Singular for a large amount of money, $2 million, which at the time, 17 years ago, a lot of money. I mean, first of all, when we heard that the deal was done, the contract was signed, I mean, this was like this was like when you finish high school right. or, or at West Point, you jump for joy and throw your hats in the air. <laughs> and um, that basically saved our bacon, but also gave us a fantastic platform. And then that's basically how it started. It's interesting in listening to you, Ralph, because one of the things that sticks out to me about what you said was just the amount of fear that the publishers had at that time and the resistance that they gave you towards something that I, I believe, you know, ultimately never was as successful in the United States as it was in foreign territories. I believe ringtones were much more successful in Japan and in Korea and in Europe than they were here in America, weren't they? Um, I think it would be fair to say that uh, in Germany, really fueled by Crazy Frog, which at the time really helped spread the whole uh, uh, popularity of it quite a lot, and also the emerging usage of mobile devices, because you must remember, now we think of mobile phones as being so much of everyone's everyday life, no one is without one, almost 100% penetration in the United States. In uh, Arab countries, 140, 150% penetration, two, two handsets per individual for your business use and your personal use, because sometimes culture uh, determines what you could say publicly and privately. But um, uh, th there was resistance. I, I was always surprised because having been a music publisher myself in an earlier evocation, I always used to think of ways in which I could get the artist's work used because if the song was in the grooves and you got more people to taste it, that taste, someone said, man, have you heard that great song by Outkast? Or have you heard of that great new thing, Blurred Lines? Have you heard how great that is? Uh, but uh, it seemed, I think, because the Napster um, dominance was uh, such a revolutionary uh, shakeup, I think that that uh, inhibited a lot of people. And, of course, the lawyers rather than the creators seemed to dominate, which, in a sense, had been the clarion call of the conventional record business for many years, uh, tempered in part by the indie community wanting to give more away and realizing that maybe there were other ways to skin the cat, but you'd still skin the cat. Exactly. Now, in 1997 or 98, I believe, you made the famous prediction that mobile phones would become the center of our, you know, uh, communication and entertainment uh, centers. And I'm curious how in 97 you, you saw that. I mean, how you saw that far in the future. It was... It seems now, in retrospect, you know, I always remember uh, at the start of the punk movement in England, when we were desperately trying to grow our publishing company, going to see Elvis Costello playing Allison at a live gig from a recording he made with Huey Lewis and the News, who were the backing group to Elvis Costello on Your Aim is True, his first album. And when I look back now, those many, many years to Elvis Costello, and we were fortunate enough to sign him at the time, at the time when history is being made, you don't realize that it's like Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. Did he realize what was going to happen with In Utero? You don't realize it at the time. And so at this particular point with that ringtone thing, all we were mainly driven by was we could see that in Silicon Valley, there was something stirring that was really new and incredibly exciting. It was also taking that spirit of the ACDC t-shirt, and it was also thinking that there is this growing generation, if you're going to look to the international to just get a, an idea of what's coming next, even though Japan and Korea is not the United States, um, it's not Kansas, it's not even West Hollywood, right. but the fact of the matter is, is that if you looked at the behavior of young people, what were they doing? They were communicating in a completely new way. Mm -hmm. It's like text messaging. When you first started to see text messaging and you saw kids sending 200 text messages in a day, what does that tell you? That's a new medium of communication, peer-to-peer. -peer. Not peer-to-peer -peer in the kind of right. downloading mode, but person-to-person. Right. -person. Person. How do you communicate? And this is no different from when 
that that really great great uh, music guy uh, who was a partner of Seymour Stein in the early days? Richard Goddard. Richard Goddard, when he wrote, My boyfriend's back and there's going to be trouble. It's classic. And this was about two girls talking to each other, said, Hey, man, my boyfriend's back and there's going to be trouble. Right. Same thing, really. So, okay, so you were just listening to the culture. You, you have were to, watching always. it and you had your ear to the ground with, okay. That's, that's always, it drives everything. You're in the mobile space, and and I'm. Can you talk to artists yeah. now as to why they should have a mobile strategy for their music? I think that would be very interesting to hear. Well, I think that uh, what has now become clearly evident is, as an artist and as a manager, you basically have to develop aspects of your audience, different slices of the way your audience uh, uh, accesses you and accesses your music, because this fuels maybe five different streams of revenue-generating activity for the artist. Your live business, obviously, if, you, uh, if you're good, and I'm not talking about just average, because there are a lot of bands that are average, and particularly today, with the democratization of the means of production, you can buy a laptop, you can have a, a set of tools, pro tools on the laptop, and anyone can make anything. But who makes great songs, great music, and then who can play great? I'm not talking about just putting on a loop, although that's also a different kind of music, but how can you develop some kind of real impact and emotional impact with live? So you've got your live music, you've got merch, which is now an established form, you've got uh, social media elements that can fuel interest. Uh, if you've got a great YouTube video, I mean, I always love the idea of these two Norwegian comedians that did what did the fox say, because they basically wrote that for a comedy show on Norwegian television. But by the same token, something like that from Norway, from Oslo. I mean, Oslo, Oslo was never really seen as a music capital of the world in the same way that Sweden was never seen as a music capital of the world until. Max Martin, great songwriter who wrote a lot of those early Britney Spears hits, still writing hits today. He was in Ace of Bass. Mm -hmm. Remember that group? Sure. It originally signed to Arista Records. That's right. But now you suddenly see that you've got to take notice of some of these things because if you can fuel all of these things, in all of them, there still is one unifying element that really drives them all. Is the record or the song in the grooves? This is something that Barry Gordy at Motown was his cornerstone. Jerry Moss and Herb Alpert, just down the road from where we're doing this interview now, same thing. Does the record touch people emotionally? And you look at the great groups that were signed there, the police, Sting still going strongly today. How do you come up with a song that touches people? That's That will always be the, the underlying essence. It's the secret source, not even secret, it's the source that drives the sorcerer. That puts the whole thing together. Um, what would you say is the best way for artists to harness these kinds of opportunities today uh, in their in their work? I think it's so much harder today for uh, artists to break through the clutter. Okay. It's a huge issue. First of all, getting a manager. I mean, one of the things now, uh, certainly in uh, in the UK and Europe, you have to pay clubs to play in a club. I mean, what nonsense is that? Surely clubs would see the value of a good band. The band can bring in uh, uh, customers or punters, as they say in, in the UK. Um, but um, it's the, you really, it's difficult. You've got to be much more of a multimedia, cross-media creative, someone who really thinks in a broad creative way, like, for example, an artist, an L.A. artist like Beck always thinks in soundscapes. I mean, his current album, just a beautiful record. Um, but um, you've got to be much, much more uh, creative in the way that you think of your visual self. Why I mentioned what did the fox say is, if you look at that video, that video is just a, a captivating, engaging video, Gangnam Style, obviously taking two very, very big successes. But even bands like Fish that have got a constituency of their own, they've developed over 20 years, you've got to have a visual identity. You've got to have a live identity. You've got to have a recorded identity and somehow find the uh, the thread that brings all of those together, which, of course, is your social media architectures and how you think that you use mobile, web, uh, and online and streaming in a combined way cleverly. And there are people that can help. In the same way that you have A&R people, mm -hmm. you've now got 
I and R people, innovation and repertoire. So artist and repertoire, innovation and repertoire. And that's the way I think you've got to be smart about doing it. Because if you can, here's an interesting thing. I've been doing some work recently with a, a wonderful artist who lives in LA called Akon. So Akon originally comes from Senegal in West Africa. Akon has got a fantastic following uh, in the UK. He's got a good following in, in Africa, as one might expect. But did you know that he's the biggest international act in India? No. Now, how did you do that? Akon from Senegal, now living in LA, how would he be the biggest act in India online and on mobile? Well, he was very smart. He decided he was going to record a song of his in Hindi. So of the 1.3 billion people in India, about 800 million people speak Hindi. Shah Rukh Khan, who's like the Brad Pitt of Indian Bollywood, heard the song, put it in one of his movies. It became a sensation. Akon has now got a multicultural appeal. All of those West Africans that live in America, and there are many, four to six million, a lot in Houston, Nigerians, oil business, Ghanaians in New York, now will relate to Akon. And those people email and text to people in West Africa. So you're seeing this interesting diaspora sure, yes. that starts to... So Akon is a very interesting example of someone that gets how you fuel this kind of intercontinental transfer of ideas and music and taste. What problems do you see the recording industry having with dealing with the changes within mobile? Because what you've been describing seems to be the future rather than just computers. It seems on a worldwide level, mobile is going to be the tool that's going to be the carrier, like you had said with the story with Akon. That's where we're going in terms of the future rather than from the computer itself. It's going to be mobile technology that takes us there. So what issues do you see arising from the recording side? Well, uh, all the new smartphone devices have got good uh, sound quality. They link in wirelessly to great sound systems. So I don't think you'll see any compromise from the point of view of still needing to make great sounding records. Um, mobile phones really are the remote control for people's daily lifestyles and uh, certainly acts as a spreader to their uh, Facebook communities, their Twitter communities. So it's an important part of how you, what I call social broadcasting, how you socially connect with your social group, which in turn, um, you know, it's an old show business standard that go goes back to the early days of Hollywood, the early days of vaudeville, the early days of Victorian melodrama of word of mouth. Man, did you see that guy who sawed the woman in half? Man, did you see the way that Jimi Hendrix played the guitar with his teeth? No, show me what can I... Please. So I think, uh, and now the fact with mobile devices and particularly with devices that can talk to each other where uh, your mobile phone will be the interface for you to see something on television, where you have something like Maker, the TV network, online TV network that has 50,000 channels. So if you wanted to be able to develop a channel, whether it's the Gene Simmons Kiss channel or whether it's the Joe Schmo and the Runaway Comebacks TV channel... They're now all of these areas. So now the big thing is you might be able to find a channel that you can be seen on, but you might only have bacteria watching you rather than having people. So how do you get to go above the clutter? That, I think, is something that is really key. And I always look at Lady Gaga as a very interesting example because I met this woman on one of my travels who runs an incredible site called Africa.com. She's a woman from New York. Her name is Teresa Clark, and I bumped into her somewhere on my travels abroad, and she said, you know, I knew that Lady Gaga was going to be successful 15 years ago. I said, what do you mean you knew 15 years ago? How did you know that? She says, well, I live in Greenwich Village, and I live in an apartment next, to, next door to the Germanotta family. Germanotta. Name rang a bell. Hey, hold on a second. Gaga's real name is Stephanie Germanotta. So you... How did you know that? She said, you know, in Greenwich Village, in the apartment in the, of the apartment I lived in had thin walls and I could hear this incredible piano and voice coming from next door from the Germanotta kid. And I knew when I heard this kid, the voice was so great. This was above the norm. 
So when I eventually saw her making being successful, I kept thinking, I knew that was going to happen early on. However, what Teresa didn't say was, and where Gaga was so much of a genius, Gaga understood the modern zeitgeist because she knew about how to get an intersection point between three key imperatives, fashion, music, and social media. She had to get the music right. Vince Herbert, her A&R guy, great songs, but she with a great song, great voice, great lyric, poker face, classic, taking that to connect at fashion, music, social media, making sure it's spread out to all of her, uh, what does she call them? Little Monsters, that's right, littlemonsters.com. So she was someone that early on managed to combine those. And when you look back now on the way that her career rose and rose and rose and rose and the influence and the impact she made for me, one of the greatest things was going to uh, Staples Center to see a Lady Gaga show and seeing about 40% of the audience, 40% dressed up like her, men, women, transgender, you name it, people who didn't know what they were, but they were wearing Lady Gaga kind of stuff. And when she sang the hits, it was exactly the same as when the Monkees sang the hits in the 60s or the Beatles sang the hits or when uh, you're seeing now with uh, electronic dance music, David Guetta, Calvin Harris, people of that nature. So, you know, the difference today is you've got to make sure you get those intersection points touching these touchstones. So, insiders, do you have a mobile strategy for your music career? Remember that in our conversation with Ralph, he famously predicted back in 1997 that the mobile phone would become the center of our communications and entertainment globally. Well, the future is here. So, insiders, question of the day. From this video, what were the most valuable takeaways to you from this interview with Ralph? Was it why you as an artist need a mobile strategy to market your music? Or was it the best ways to harness new and emerging opportunities that exist for you in mobile technology? Or was it the changes that he sees occurring within the recording industry that may be problematic? Or maybe it was something else that connected with you. If you have any ideas or experiences that you'd like to share regarding this video, we'd love to hear from you and connect in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe to Mubu TV for more information on how to educate, empower, and engage your music career. You can also check out a summary of this episode and everything we talked about in the YouTube description as well. And if you enjoyed this video, we'd really love it if you hit the like button and let us know what other kinds of videos and content you want to see on this channel. Hit us up in the comments below, and we'll see you in the next video.